This is only as good as your questions, so far So away. who's got some questions? I'm going to come out into the audience here. Here we go. Let's get this started. Nice earrings. John doesn't want to be here, by the way. Well, oh. I do want to be here. I, I, okay. <laughs> but John's not one of us in the audience, right, John? It's not my job to do that. He's got it. All yeah. right, I got somebody over here for you. Who are you talking to, by the way? Me. <laughs> of all the stories, which one was my favorite? That you were not in. That I wasn't in? I wasn't in any of them. Yeah. Yeah. But, but you were integral to every one of them. Okay. The show. My favorite is probably uh, uh, the crate. Because I had never built an animatronic creature before. And Fluffy was my first. Fluffy was the crate creature. Good question. <laughs> And by the way, uh, is here. Daryl is fluffy. Hello. Listen, Creep Show, Creep Show was five movies, five little movies, and it was only me and Daryl doing all the effects in that movie. My seventeen, my seventeen-year-old assistant, Daryl. <laughs> it was awesome. How about for the rest of you? What were what were your favorite uh, parts of the anthology? Which Oh, I love them all. I think the most stunning for me, though, was the uh, creeping up on you with the, with the cockroaches. Uh, yeah. I, uh, I was defiled by uh, many insects during the shooting. And I, would, I reached a point, uh, I was doing some diopter shots with one of the, when one of the uh, cockroaches. It was a very, very, very tight, super tight shot. Close up on the Very thing. close up, right, on, on the eyes of the cockroach. And I happened to note when I was filming, there were other creatures uh, perusing around the cockroach. So I asked one of the entomologists, what, what are those things? He said, oh, those are whites, and there's millions of them. And so I suddenly had the notion, I can see these guys, but I can't see these millions of mites that are flying. Uh, so from that point on, when I went home at night, I would literally strip in the backyard, hang my clothing up on the clothing line, and go inside naked by man. But, I was, but you still had mites on you. I still had mites. Yes. Yeah. I said they just stay with your clothing. Maybe they did. I, I was. I, I'm, 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 I'm itching to this day, actually. Adrian, what was what was your favorite of the anthology? I don't think I've ever seen the whole movie. <laughs> <laughs> you pansy. This is not my kind of film, believe me. And you couldn't have paid me enough to be E.G. Marshall. I mean, there was no way I was gonna. Even watch the, the roaches. He wouldn't, he, yeah, he wouldn't accept a stand in. He would oh, actually, he wanted to do all those stunts, you know, with crawling up legs. And stuff. You were wonderful in it, though, by the way. Thank you. Absolutely. It was all George. It was all George. That character is nothing like she really is. <laughs> so, real quick, for those of you that are just joining us, because they kind of hit the stage, we didn't get to give them a proper introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, cast and crew members of Creep Show, we have joining us yeah. Mr. John Amplitz, yeah. Michael Gordon, Daryl Ferrucci, yeah. Tom Savini, So I'm going to be walking around, I'll take your questions, make sure that you've got a good one, put your hands up, and I'll get you... Hey! Thanks to all of you for being a part of the greatest period of horror ever. I just appreciate that in my lifetime I got to see all of your work, so thank you. This question's for Adrian. You played such a, and I say this in a nice... Bitch! Bitch! bitch. <laughs> that show, I just was... And Tom just said that's not your personality. Was that a tough... Role for you or not? You know, uh, <laughs> I'm going to back up a little bit and say when I fir when they first sent me the screenplay, I, I can't do this. This is this is vile. This is ooh, this is terrible. I I'm not going to do this. This is horrendous. I didn't know anything about George, although I was married to John Carpenter at the time, and he said, "Are you kidding me? You're going to pass up an opportunity to work with 
George Romero, I don't know, I, I, this is not my field. Tommy Atkins is a very close friend and he had already been cast. And I called Tom and I said, Tom, you're doing this movie? I mean, it's just, ooh, it's ooh, really creepy and uh, it's terrible. He said, oh, Adie, you don't get it at all. It's gonna be very stylized, it's gonna be a cartoon, it's gonna be very funny, you've gotta do it. Okay. So, I don't drink. I've never, I've never liked the taste of alcohol, so I, I've never been drunk. And um, I didn't know what I was gonna do. I showed up for the first day of rehearsal and I said to George, you know, I'll sort of do what I think I'm gonna do, but if it's not right, you better send me home because I'm really out of my depth here. And um, to answer your question specifically about Billy, Nobody ever thinks of themselves as a bad person or a, or a bitch, you know. She didn't think she was a bitch. So I had to understand why she was like that. And I think she was really disappointed with her life, you know. She, was, she thought she was going to be the queen of academia. She had married this professor and he was going to rise in the ranks and, and it wasn't working out like that. And, and to deal with that disappointment and the pain in her marriage, she started drinking, and and then that's. You had a very nice home. I had a very nice home. <laughs> that that was something. That was something. Yes. And so, I didn't set her out. I didn't set out. Oh, I'm just going to play a bitch. I'm going to play a woman who's, you know, she's unhappy with her life, and this is how she reacts. But if it hadn't been for George, because. I came from the, I had just come from working with John, who the, the greatest piece of advice he gave me was do less, you know. Uh, and suddenly there was this character, and George <laughs> kept saying, no, you can be bigger, you can be bigger. And I'm like, oh my God, I'm just going to be, they're going to laugh me off the screen, you know. But I, I, he was my director, and I thought, okay, well, if I fall on my face, <laughs> Well, it's George's fault. But, uh, so I really own that whole character in George. The only thing I can take credit for is when I first went to New York, before I got on Broadway, I was working as a cocktail waitress, barmaid in a mafioso-run joint, truly. I mean, the guy was one of the head of the five families. And uh, no, no, uh, uh, Maddie's Mardi Gras. <laughs> Maddie, Jim, Maddie, I can't remember. Anyway, Ionelli, I think it was. And the boss had an ulcer, and he always drank bourbon with milk. So really, the only thing I brought to Billy was that drink when she pours the milk and she starts drinking. Yeah. But the rest was George. Well, we made a cast of Adrian because after Fluffy's done with her, her remains float to the top of the water. It's not in the film. I didn't know that. I mean, maybe I remember the cast, but I didn't know that was... Yeah, there was a chunk of you with your face. Oh, really? Oh. <laughs> that chunk? Like a miniature? Like a miniature? Let's find that guy. Mr. Bernstein. He's got the mic. Yeah. Mike over there. Hi, how you doing? Um, I was going to ask you guys a question. I'm Jake. <laughs> I was want to know, like, what was the inspiration for Creep Show? Was there like elements like, did they use like Twilight Zone for inspiration? And how do you guys prepare for like your characters? Also, this is for all of you, like for each person here. How do you guys describe your characters here? I like to know how you prepare to play them. Yeah. Well, I mean, to put it to put it simply, in terms of the inspiration, both Steve King, uh, God bless him, the stories we expanded upon. And then later, George, who did the much of the screenplay work, were both inspired by the comics of the early 50s, the EC comics. And they were always tales that had a bit of morality. They, uh, you committed a sin, it was retribution for your sin. Lucky. Uh, yeah, yeah. And um, as we later adopted in Carl Entertainment, a uh, moral tale is a moral tale. You know, uh, but that was the whole gist of uh, their inspiration, was those early comics. And likewise, visually, some of my inspiration came from those, and even 
later in time, as I, as I witnessed uh, and, and read uh, you know, Prince Valiant in the Daily Beat comics, um, and uh, Steve Canyon, some of those authors of those comics had a very film, filmic sense about them in terms of their angles and uh, their color and their splashes. Uh, so that was my inspiration. But truly, the stories came from the early EC comics. Character-wise, we just decided we wanted to be in the film. Me and Marty Schiff, so we were the garbage man at the end. <laughs> and he's garbage man number one, it says in the credits. <laughs> he never lets me down on that. Man. He had a better life. You're garbage number two. Yeah, better life. So were you, you were a fan of the comic books then? Well, you know, so yes, in fact, I did have a role, and uh, I am now considered a movie star. But, you know, of course, um, the reason I was there is to assist Tom in creating all the things. And I mean, what happened was we were going to create, as Tom said, this complex mechanical monster. And who was going to play the monster? And since I was there all the time, we just built it onto my body, right? Yeah. Just because he was there. Yeah. And willing to, you know, have fiberglass and foam rubber and mechanisms strapped onto me and into it, actually, you know? So, um, as far as character, well, you all have seen Creepshow probably, and you know Fluffy's character. I mean, all I had to do was move around a little and uh, smash Adrian's head against the wall. I, mean, I will tell you, like, one direction that I remember coming from George. I wonder if you'll remember this moment. And uh, we were at the bottom of the stairwell. And um, um, Billy is, a, you know, in her final moments, and I'm there as the creature with, and we're against the back wall. And George says to me, and he, he looks very thoughtful. And he says, "Take her head in your hand and smash it against the back wall like a rotten cantaloupe." <laughs> That's the most funniest thing I remember George ever saying. <laughs> what did I say? I, did, I, you remained in character, you were just doing the job, you're a professional. <laughs> I don't think you were frightened at that moment, beyond acting frightened. <laughs> oh, I played dead Nathan Grantham. How did you get that part? Well, uh, Mr. Tom Savini gave me a call. I was about 40 or 50 pounds lighter in those days, and so uh, he was building a costume that would make me very emaciated. I sat under plaster for about a week or so, uh, getting all the parts ready to go. He built, I went away, he built a costume, I came back, I shot for a week, and I had the pleasure of working with some of the finest ladies I've ever known, Vivica Linfers and uh, Carrie Nye, who was a hoot. Uh, I went on to do a play with her, I stayed for manager of the play she was in, about 50 years ago, 40 years ago. But um, uh, yeah, that was my uh, that was my introduction to playing dead. Did she remember you when you worked with her later? Uh, Carrie. Yeah. As being Nate's corpse? Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. It was actually shortly after we had done the film. At the Playhouse? At the Playhouse, yeah. It was played by Tom Thomas and it was um, uh, 30 years later, uh, after the importance of being earnest, and so Algie and Gwendolyn, they had kids, and <laughs> so it was kind of an interesting play, and it was fun. I always loved Carrie, because she had a great sense of humor, and she always talked like this, because she smoked, and she, <laughs> and she was a chain smoker, but I loved her, she was really hilarious. And Vivica Linfors was a real trooper. I got to work with her rolling around on the ground, for goodness sake. And, um, but she was an idol uh, and just a delight, delightful person. Um, so my, 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 my role was uh, playing dad. Um, and I was uh, fortunate enough to be, you know, the other half of the great John Moore, who played Nathan Grantham, Grantham as, a, as a living human being. Um, so it was a lot to hold up, uh, <laughs> but um, yeah, that was my, uh, but it was you that uh, called me okay. at Castle. Actually, I just did your face and your hands, uh, the costume department. Did and, but I asked them to make it big, too big for you, so you would look emaciated within it. Exactly. And they did. They made it skin tight. So. It was. Yes. Yeah. <laughs>
Yeah. But you know what? Uh, check out a, an Errol Flynn movie called Don Juan, because Vivica Linford plays the young, gorgeous queen in that movie. But it was in the 40s, I think. In fact, when she walked in the door, I took her face in my hand. And I said, you were the queen in Don Juan, and I love you. <laughs> <laughs> it was the beginning of our, we, we didn't have a relationship, but you know. It was the beginning of our, of our friendship. Anybody else? Well, first off, uh, I might get stumped for that, but I gotta say, Freak Show is my favorite Romero movie. So, kudos to you guys. Uh, probably everyone heard about the story, but I want to hear it from you guys. Uh, I hate bugs. I just hate them. Uh, apparently, no bugs. Bugs, yeah. Apparently, it was a nightmare working on the set with cock. Can you explain it to me? The two entomologists that we sent to Trinidad to collect the roaches, the stories they told of collecting those roaches were scarier than anything in the movie. You know, the, the roaches live in bat dung, bat shit, okay? So they would just put rubber bands around their pants legs, and dig a hole as far as they could in the bat dung, turn the light off, wait 60 seconds, turn the light back on, the hole was filled with those roaches. They would quickly stuff them in plastic bags. They said that uh, hey, bats don't use their radar in the caves, so they would fly right into them. Because they know the cave, you know. But they had bats flying into their mouths. You know. but they said there were so many roaches in the bat dung, they would lie down on the cave floor, and the roaches would move them around. <laughs> Very scary. Did they get hazard pay? No, they, they enjoyed all this. They enjoyed and it. Right? When, when they returned, and now here's an odd story. So they would stuff all these roaches in 40 gallon drums to bring back to the United States. And they started wondering to you know, where customs problems to bring back to the <laughs> When they told the authorities that this was for a Stephen King film, they said, you go right in there. <laughs> so uh, we were about orders now. Think about that. Well, there, were, there were three drums. Steve, Richards, and Georges. The Georges were the biggest ones, the Steves were the middle-sized ones, and the producer, Richard Grimstein, his were the puny ones. Yeah. <laughs> so George could say, bring me 10,000 Richards and you know, 5,000 Steves, you know, that's how they but As soon as the roaches hit the ground, they were gone. Yeah. Most of the roaches in Creepshow are pistachio nut shells, painted black. But upon their return from the caves, uh, they thought, well, put us at ease, they had classes uh, on, you know, bugs and you, at our, during our, uh, our, our lunches, to make, put us at ease with the bugs, it never worked. They had slideshows, and they're actually harmless, they don't carry diseases, you should be worried about it. Uh, never worked. But as Tom says, you know, once you put them on set, they scattered like crazy. Yeah. I, I had the pointing question when we finished shooting, I said, well now guys, uh, when we abandon the studio, what are you going to do? Well, it was part of their contract. They were supposed to destroy the roaches. So they threw a couple of DT bombs in the room, and that didn't work. They were no, like three and days then he told me, he goes, you know, you're in a winter climate here in Pennsylvania, so I used to know that. Probably, no, probably. <laughs> no, at the end, there was a bonfire, you know, and just about everybody was gone, but uh, Tom and I were there. Tom lives there. We were there just wrapping stuff up, and one day I drove to work at the studio out in, outside Monroeville. There was a bonfire on the grounds, and I knew what that was. They were burning the roaches. There are many bug stories. I want to tell you, like... You I know, bet they're still there. Oh, I, think, <laughs> oh, they, I don't go near that location, though. I've never been back again. Like, for instance, you release a thousand giant cockroaches on a set, right? Now, I mean, the set was pretty well sealed up, although they could climb and they could potentially fly and climb out. But what do you do when you're ready to wrap? Well, what they do is they have tanks of carbon dioxide that's heavier than air, and it displaces the oxygen, and they just spray carbon dioxide all over the place, and it knocks all the bugs out, and then they sweep them up, and a few of them die, and you know they see which ones perk up and revive for next next scene, and that's how they do it. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah, it's, it's a creep show. It's a creep show. It's creepy. Way back there, there's a couple of questions. All right, let me get you up there. 
I was never in the same room with those roaches. I was looking through a window in a sealed room, cue the blood, <laughs> pump the roaches, you know. I was we, we, were, we were doing a test on E.G. Marshall's head because the roaches come out of him, okay? So there was a syringe in there with a trap door. The trap door was open. You were in the room. I put my hand on E.G. Marshall's mouth and I said, release the roaches or something. And a uh, rose came up and touched my hand. I remember being across the room, but not knowing how I got there. <laughs> no, I hate roaches. My question is, how did Leslie get involved in the you know, filming of Creep Show, and also did he bring his remote control flatulence? Of course he did. Of course. <laughs> Tom Atkins has told a story last night about that. They went to dinner. I forget who it was. It was Christine Romero, I think, at the time. And um, suddenly they heard a sound. <coughs> and. Uh, At the end of the dinner, you know, Leslie finally said, uh, this is making noise. <laughs> so he was a jokester for sure. The couple at the next table when they were leaving said to him, you're the most disgusting person. <laughs> I was there when he was interviewed by uh, Channel 4 television. Uh, on set, he and Ted Danson, and he, of course, set off his congratulations machine. And blame Ted Danson. <laughs> Turn Sunday's at 10, please. <laughs> yeah. All right, quick question. Um, was the skeleton at the beginning real? Yes. And how did you get it to float? Uh, it was on a fulcrum that a guy would operate, and he was totally mechanized. It's a real skeleton. Uh, it came from India, and on the box it said, a product of India, a real human skeleton. It came from a company called Carolina Biological Supplies. Yeah, yeah you could buy rat models and you know, tarantulas, dead cat. Yeah, we used to, we used to get dead cat from them for uh, uh, Jason Begay, uh, monkey shots. Also, the, we got small cockroaches from them, or you know, medium cockroaches. From Carolina? Yeah. Oh, for the move for Creek? Oh, yeah, yeah. So to bulk out the living cockroaches, you know, background, medium, big cockroaches, only a couple inches long. The, the scene in the, in the bedroom when there were all the roaches come out of the bedroom vent on the floor, the entomologist had a funnel outside the set, and they took these huge drums of roaches and poured them in the funnel, expecting them to come out of the grate, but they just back-treaded all over them. <laughs> The, entom we, the entomologist was running out of the room, covered. I couldn't see him. He was just a massive roach. Yes? Okay. Um, at the end of their creeping up on you, how did you make the cockroaches come out of the sewer thing? I couldn't figure, I, I knew how to make them come out of E.G. Marshall's mouth. It was a huge syringe that the entomologist filled with roaches and pushed the plunger so the roaches were forced to come out of his mouth. We had blood pumping on the roaches so they would leave little bloody roach footprints. <laughs> but I couldn't figure out, I was, this is the fifth movie, I was kind of burned down. I couldn't figure out how to make them come out of his chest. And George said, why don't you just make the hole already and cover it with toilet paper and then make up the toilet paper like skin and some hair. And that's exactly what worked. So George saved the day with that. And, and I was there for that because I personally didn't really mind the roaches. And I was up for whatever weird thing had to be done, you know. There were two of us. must have been Debbie Pinthus with me, I forget for sure. Because there, there were two plexiglass tubes. Tom's talking about syringes. They were like this diameter for the mouth and like this diameter for the chest. Underneath the makeup stuff. Oh, she was done. she was down there, wasn't she? Probably. I was under the bed. That's all a set. So I, I was under the bed, with, like to operate. I think the mouth syringe, and we got our cue. And I think Tom, you must have been on the blood tubes, maybe. But at a distance. And then we just had to like push the syringe and get those roaches to go crawling all out. So there were two of us operating two big plexiglass plungers full successful. of giant cockroaches. That was successful. 
Oh, we, yeah. we, we screamed. We applauded. Yeah. We loved it when the roaches came out of his chest because so many did. You know? yeah. They had nowhere else to go. <laughs> Little bloody roaches. We must have made those, right? It was like a flat disc and a plexiglass handle. I don't oh, know. A syringe? Yeah, it was just a plexiglass. Oh, it, was, uh, it was the foam latex. Cylinders. The foam latex tubes. Remember how we pumped foam Is latex? Is that what it was? Yeah, yeah, we just took those and the entomologist you know, used them okay. as, as roach experting syringes. Yeah. yeah. Um, yes, um, working with Hal Holbrook, I was wondering um, any good stories or I just remember the first day of rehearsal, Hal walked in and he had on the most beautiful belt buckle on his a cowboy, like a cowboy belt buckle, and I think he had on boots, which made me feel very comfortable. <laughs> and um, I, I, I don't remember anything specific except that both the fellas, Fritz, Weaver, and Hal, were just great to work with. They were just, they were lovely, you know, but I, specific stories I don't recall. Well, I couldn't stop staring at him because I loved him as Mark Twain. <laughs> you know, was, in fact, every now and then he would go into that, just as a joke, you know, to do a couple of lines. Yes, yeah. Hey guys. I feel like this is kind of the beginning and the end of Stephen King's acting career. Like you read interviews, oh. <laughs> I think he's really embarrassed by his performance. I think it was great. I think he nailed the cam. But I, it's it was been, perfect for what it was. Yeah, exactly. And I think it's one of the, my. It's my favorite segment. I think it's one of the funniest out of the, of the whole anthology. Golly! <laughs> you well, lunkhead! So 1981, 1982, Stephen King. What's he like? What were your memories of working with him? And all the he, great makeup. He's just a big kid that happens to be a genius, okay? He was missing from the set one day, and I had to go to a war surplus store to look for supplies. And he was walking down this six-lane highway on the median strip, yeah. reading a book and drinking Perrier, you know. <laughs> you know, I wasn't surprised when they got hit by that van, you know, because here he is walking down the middle. So I honked my horn, and he came with me to the store, you know. I bought stuff, he bought stuff. He put his credit card down, and the girl said, oh, I bet you you're the Stephen King. And I'm going, he is! He is! Because <laughs> he wouldn't say anything anyway. So. The most unpretentious ever ever want to meet up. He, was, he would go back and forth to North Carolina when he did Max Moulton on a motorcycle. You know, he didn't want any for travel concerns, and he had planes or a driver or whatever. I remember one incident when he was coming through on the Pennsylvania Turnpike, office and said, say Mike, can I stop and do some uh, typing? You know, type right there. And I said, sure, come on by. So he came by and he banged out two or three pages and got back in his car and went on to you know. Uh, all I remember never is, uh, when we first all arrived in Pittsburgh to, to start filming, George and Chris, his wife at the time, had, had us over for dinner. And Stephen just kept asking Tommy Atkins, What's Jamie Lee really like? <laughs> I would echo what these guys say that like he was just a real nice, straightforward guy with no pretension whatever, and he was kind of much like a kind and considerate but overgrown teenage kid, you know? He was way cool. And he hung out with Tom and I a lot just because we were by definition the special place. We were doing all the special effects and he and others would love to come and hang out and check out what process is going on, you know? So. Well, everything we did worked in Creepshow, except anything we tried on Stephen King. Do you remember? What, what, what did we what Well, we had, we had a, a tongue that grew. We made a cast of his tongue and it grew and it wouldn't work. Now, everything we've done worked because there's take two, take three, you do it until it works. Nothing we did, and I wanted to impress this guy, you know, Stephen King. We had green lenses that we couldn't get in his eyes, remember? Right. His reflexes were too tight. We had a, his hand glue plants. Nothing worked, anyway. But for, I'm sure all of you know, because I assume you're all here because you're really hardcore fans, but the boy who plays a Tommy's son in the interstitials is Joe Hill famous author himself, Joe Hill, Stephen's son. And he, 
he hung out with us as well in the studio. Yeah. He lived in the makeup effects studio. In fact, in his book, Full Throttle, he describes his experience on Creepshow as, I was his babysitter, because his dad was busy shooting, so I was his babysitter. So he's hired me now five times. <laughs> Joe Hill, Nosferatu, um, what else did he, uh, I'm trying to think of the TV series that he put me in. Nosferatu was one of them. Lock and Key. Lock and Key, Lock and Key, right, right. So anyway, but he was responsible for me getting five different parts because of those days. Here's some hands. Oh, over there, way over there. I just want to say thank you for all of you for coming out this weekend on this weird, chilly day. I do have a question for Adrienne. It's about, it's more on the realm of dark fantasy than it is of horror. And it is about a show that you were actually in that canceled almost 20 years ago. I hope you remember. It was called Carnival. And I wanted to ask you if you, do you have your own personal, how do I say it? What are your personal thoughts on the series as a whole? And do you have any personal memories that you still hold on to from your experience today? Um, is it Danielle? Danielle Knopf, yes. Danielle, right. Um, Carnival was one of my all-time favorite jobs. It was just, uh, it was just, ideal for me. I loved it. I loved everything about it. I went into the audition. I wasn't right for the role. The, she was described as uh, in her, maybe in her 70s or 80s or 90s, I don't know, wizened old lady. And, um, and I didn't know anything about it except that it was a carnival and I didn't even know it was set in the 30s. Uh, so I figured it, they were carny workers, sort of, you know, New, and I remember thinking, my hair doesn't look like a carny worker. So I had an old wig that I had used in some horror film, and uh, I went to somebody and I said, "Could you put this on me?" And, and they got into everything. I went into the audition, and I walked in and looked in the mirror, and I had this, this tumor on the top of my head, the way she had put the wig on, all my hair was piled up, and I thought, oh God, how am I going to do this? But I went in and did the audition, and uh, they asked me if I liked snakes. I said, I, I don't have any problem with snakes. Roaches? I won't go near, but snakes, I don't care. I don't have any problem. And when I came out, the CD said, the casting director said, that was fantastic. And I said, really? I said, my wig didn't look, he said, I didn't know you were wearing a wig. <laughs> and I never heard from him again. That was before Thanksgiving. And a couple days before Christmas, I got the call that they had hired me, that I hadn't even had to go to, which was so, because she wasn't what, I wasn't what they had on the page. But it turned out to, and then I got to read the script, and then I was like, oh my gosh, this is fantastic. The, the metaphysics of it, the uh, and then the cast was it was it was just a wonderful, wonderful job and a role for a woman at that time I was in my early fifties to be playing that kind of a character was you know, women in their early fifties got to play nurses or maybe a lawyer, or maybe a judge. Didn't you have twins? I had the twins, yeah. the twins, and which made it all the better because there were so many of us in the company that I only worked maybe three days a week so I could take the kids to school, bring them back. I came home after the first night of shooting. They had put the, they had put the snake tattoo on my arm, and I thought, oh my God, the kids are gonna love this. They were about five, maybe six, I'm not sure. Mom, what is that? Get that thing off of you. Mom, oh, mom, don't ever do that again. You know, which was the same reaction they had when they saw Cannonball Run and I unzipped my zipper. Yeah. <laughs> mom, how could you do that? <laughs> but uh, it was wonderful. It was wonderful. It was canceled. I mean, the reason they, it was a very expensive show to do because it was shot in the 30s, so they had to do a lot of uh, post-production, you know, get rid of the telephone wires and everything. It was very expensive. 
HBO would, had just come off of The Sopranos and Six Feet Under, and they were getting huge numbers. It was before cable, before streaming, certainly. And so they wanted those kinds of numbers. And we didn't find our crossover audience soon enough. The first season was pretty, a lot of people were like, what is going on here? What, you know, it was a little obscure. Um, I think had we had one more season, it would have really, and it was really the precursor to so much of what you, we see on TV now, you know, you know this, the paranormal and the metaphysical and lost and all of those things where people disappear and they come back and things like that. But um, I'm glad you liked it. I, it was one of my favorites. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hi, uh, question for you. Uh, first of all, thank you all for being here. But um, as you know, in this world today, there's a lot of remakes. And if you were to make... A lot of what? Remakes. Remakes. Remakes, remakes reboots, whatever you want to call them. And if you were to make the exact same film today, what would your ideal cast be? <laughs> cat? The cast? That's, that's an essay question. <laughs> You know, come back next week and we'll write like 15 pages. You know, I don't think there's any reason to remake that same mm -hmm. film because it still, it still holds up. It's just, it's... Wasn't there one that just came out, a creep show? Well, a series. Oh, there's a, a, the TV series. Not, not the TV series, a, a really shitty movie. <laughs> <laughs> creep show three, am I right? Yes. Oh, You're kidding, uh, really? Oh. <laughs> Thankfully, you didn't say Creep Show. Not Creep Show two. That's a fun thing, fun question to think about. Who would you cast? <laughs> Today? Wow. Who would I cast? You know, another point about that crazy idea is that um, nowadays, Okay, okay, Creepshow is revered and beloved today as the great classic is, but if it was made today, audiences would go see it and say, what's up with these special effects? Because they're gonna expect Avengers style, super over the top digital effects for everything, right? And I mean, Fluffy would have to have glowing eyes and be shooting something out of his eyes. You know, I mean like the real world physical practical effects that we were doing for everything would not fly in a new film today. But isn't that what happened, and I never saw it, but from what I've heard, with the remake of The Fog, they all said, oh, you, why CGI or something? And it didn't work. So maybe it, maybe the audiences right. these days would rather see what, what we did. I think well, Joe Hill should play Steven's part. Yeah. <laughs> Joe Hill for Stevens Park. <laughs> well, if you when you when you look at American Werewolf in London, that stuff was happening right in front of you. There was no CGI. When you see any of my stuff, it's happening right in front of you. And that's there seems to be a collective dislike of CGI uh, for that reason. But it's it's an economic thing, you know. When there's CGI blood, there's no cleanup. Like if I had to tear Joe Pilato in half again, creep, that's a six-hour wait, you know. CGI. Next take immediately. So sometimes it's an economical decision. Are you, yeah, okay. All right, so this is a dual question for uh, Mr. Sabini and Mrs. Barbeau. Uh, Tom, what was going through your head when you were designing Fluffy and Mrs. Barbeau? What was your first reaction to seeing Fluffy? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I did a bunch of sketches and I had artist friends of mine do sketches. We gave all the sketches to Stephen King and George Romero, and they picked one of mine, which is what Fluffy wound up looking like. So, just a sketch, because I thought Tasmanian Devil. If I were to do it again, I would make Fluffy real skinny, bony, because he's been in that box for like a hundred years. You know? He was fat, okay. <laughs> but yeah, he could have got fat later, yeah. well, and that would have made more sense. During the movie, right? Yes. <laughs> well, one of the Creepshow TV episodes, that was turned down was this discovery of Fluffy. Oh, the, I was wondering if that would ever... In the Antarctic, yeah. Oh. That's something we presented, but they didn't want to go that way. A prequel. And, yeah. A Fluffy prequel. Yeah. Okay. And I'm afraid I'm going to disappoint you because I don't remember. Do you remember? Had I, did I have any reaction? Did I say, you scream oh, a lot. cute. <laughs> well, I, but that was, act, that was Billy yeah, screaming. Yeah, yeah. Um, I 
just thought it was when, cute. I think. When would you have first seen him? Because we, we invited people into the studio, hey, come look what we did. You know, Dama would be in the costume. I'm doing the remote control eyes and mouth and stuff, you know. And, uh, you know, so, and Cletus came in, the art director. And I don't remember if you and, came and, in. I mean, it might have been right behind me. I, don't, I never really did see him. He was behind me. I can't recall the moment, but it had to be sometime on set, like down in the bottom of the stairs. I think it was definitely on set. set which was yeah. there at the studio outside the room, though. But you're right, because he's in the box. You came in, the box was closed. Yeah. It didn't open until he killed you, and he came from behind. Yeah, so. <laughs> One scene, really, I guess. Right? I'm, I'm, I'm ashamed to say that people have come up to me over the years and said, well, was that an animatronic, or was there somebody in it? Or what? Um, I don't remember. <laughs> and now, now we've I know. met again. Now I know. It was Daryl. There's a guy right here that's had his hand up for like a half an hour. <laughs> this better be good, buddy. <laughs> All right. Um, for the uh, special effects guys, um, I was going to kind of go off that um, CGI thing. I think almost everyone here can agree practical is better than the CGI. Um, 80s stuff was amazing, 90s, you know, they started using, you know, CG, and then in the 2000s, it just became everything, you know, like with Star Wars. Um, I think that it's best used as kind of like a combination of practical and then, you know, doing the CGI for things you can't really do in real life. Um, do you find that nowadays you have to kind of change the way that you build things or do things where you have to kind of think ahead about what they can do later? Um, well, on the, they're doing that on The Walking Dead every day. Yeah. You know, someone's got green pants on because the legs are big on and they're crawling across the thing. There was an episode, one of the first season episodes that Greg Nicotero directed, they were, they were all in front of a trough and being banged on the head and the throats were cut. Remember that scene? Oh, I hated that scene. It was so gross. But they didn't even put appliances on the people's necks. They just put tubing that would shoot blood out. And the visual effects guys later would just erase it. So I'm sure they thought, pre-thought that, you know, not doing appliances because this, don't worry, the visual effects guys will erase it. We'll fix it in post. That's sort of so thing. very different from like when Tom was teaching me originally how we're going to do all this stuff, he would show me, he's got this trick, you know, we're going to cast, let's say, Adrian's neck, for example, if she were getting her throat slashed, but she wasn't in this film. But, and where you route the tubing and then mix up the blood, you know, in our lab. Well, the bladders, you became the yeah. king of yeah. bladders. You did a lot of experiments <laughs> with bladders that we could pump air into from yeah. Buffy's cheeks. Blood, yeah. Somebody had to bleed. Yeah. Right. Tom knew how to get this material from the Smooth On Company, you know, and it's a rubber, a very soft rubber you can brush on. It's much nicer than latex, and so yeah, with multiple layers of that, you can make a space in there and fit. Two but you're right. Toe. The best effects are a combination of CGI and practical. And when the new Evil Dead movie came out, they were bragging there's no CGI in this. Movie. J.J. Abrams did the last Star Wars movie, or two movies ago. He boasted that he, there was a lot of practical stuff. I personally thanked him at a convention for all the practical stuff. Yeah, he, 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 he wants more practical stuff. So, you know, it's not going to erase us. You know. It just depends on the budget. Yeah, I just want to thank you guys. I love the creativity that practical. You know how practical it was? Okay, there was even, when you see the creep, who we personally we call Raoul, the skeletal creature, right? The creep is at the window and there's a big giant full moon in the background. Well, that was a Duratrans, you know, a translucent photo print of the moon it was back right there. at, it like, was right behind there. the skeleton, be, behind the set. Let's get some wind. We kept adding, we kept adding stuff to that effect. Because he was just there with the moon. Now let's get some trees in there, you know? Let's get a fan to blow his costume around. Yeah. Just kept going and going and going. And then, of course, he turns into animation two seconds after you see him. Yeah. Oh, you got somebody? Okay. Uh, hi, this is for Tom Speedy. Uh, what is your favorite effect that you've made in the process behind 
What was my favorite effect period ever? Yeah, I'll say. It's kind of hard because they're all my children, you know, Fluffy's my children, Lizzie from Tales from the Dark Side. Um, Fluffy especially because I had never done one before. The grandpa makeup in Texas Chainsaw. You know, all that stuff, but um, what's my favorite? Um, I think, you know, on I, my favorite movie that I was in was Dust Till Dawn. Yeah. Yeah. Listen, my job for three days was to watch Selma Hayek do that snake thing. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody had to do it. Pretty good job. Yeah, that was a good job. If you can get it. I was actually talking about you yesterday, Tom, how oh. I feel like you are super underrated as an actor. Everything that I've ever seen you in, you've just been absolutely amazing. You always seem to steal the show. Oh, thanks. And I think I, I was even telling this this guy over here, Dusk Till Dawn, you were probably my favorite character in the movie. Oh, thank you. So, uh, well, you know, a guy called Sex Machine <laughs> is going to be kind of popular, especially with the apparatus that I wore, the crotch rocket, you know. Look, look it, it took a year of begging, but I finally got that crotch rocket. So you finally. just answered my question, if you have that at home. Yeah, it's at home. <laughs> we had a guy over here that had a question. Where's he? Right, right over there. Hi, how you doing? Uh, this question's for Tom. Out of all the effects that you've done throughout all of your films, would you think that the Romero films were more um, associated with your experience in Vietnam, of what you saw in photograph, where you're able to, especially in Day of the Dead, since they were, they were in a bunker, or do you think that maybe yeah, they, the Romero they, films were probably... No, no, Vietnam was a lesson in anatomy for me. You know, I saw horrible stuff, and what saved me, looking at it through the camera, was how would I create that? Like, the, like, what you don't know is, uh, and I hated movies when they go to a crime scene the next day and the blood is red. Blood would have been dark brown by then, 24 hours, you know. And every dead body, the jaw, you know, none of your muscles work, including your jaw. So the jaw is always slack. I hate movies when actors are dying and they're pretending to be, you know, they want to look pretty for the camera, you know. It's not like that. And the eyes are always open. It takes a muscle contraction to close the eyes. This is a big mistake they make in movies all the time. It pisses me off, really. <laughs> but then I, they haven't seen what I've seen. Them, so. But wait, the question. Yes, it was a uh, yeah. So if the fake stuff didn't give me the same feeling I got when I saw the real stuff, the fake stuff isn't real enough. So because all my stuff is anatomically correct, and especially Day of the Dead. You're very welcome. So we've got time for one more question and Mike's right there behind you. Let's take that one right there. Hi. Um, as a follow-up to what were your favorite effects you've ever done, are there any movies you've watched that someone else did and you're like, man, I wish I had thought of that first? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> any examples? Constantly. Every time Rick Baker does something, or Rob Bottin, or you know, Steve Johnson, or when Stan Winston was alive, yeah. yeah. Because it's a brotherhood, you know, we can't help it. But, Admire, you know, the, the, the great artists and what you do. Is that the last question? No, actually, I'm just told we got one, time for one more, so. Hey, yeah, just grab him. Grab him by the head. Uh, what was your most favorite scene the whole movie? Favorite scene in the whole movie? Yeah. Go for it, John. What, what scene? What are you talking about? <laughs> this is the creep show panel. This is the creep show panel. Yeah. We're talking about creep show. Do I have a favorite? Scene? So his question was, yes. To me. No. What was the favorite scene when you saw Citizen Kane? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would like to hear that. Yeah. I think I'm awake now. I'm, uh, uh, my, my favorite scene. Uh, in creep show. <laughs> I keep going back to other movies. I don't know in my head I do anyway. You were Nate's corpse. I was Nate's corpse. That's right. I, I call him dead. Um, I, well, I, I'll tell a story on myself, uh, uh, which is it's not really. Well, it was a scene. It did end up in the film. Um, there's uh, that that scene with 
uh, Nate coming up out of the grave, and he has uh, maggots coming out of his eyes and his mouth, and um, so I was given a choice, wrongfully given a choice. And uh, George said, "Well, you don't have to. You don't have to do it if you don't want to." And I said, "Good, I don't want to." <laughs> and um, so a girl, a girl from the, the crew. coward that I am. Yeah, uh, there was a lovely young Debbie, Debbie Pintus. She Debbie, was terrific. terrific. She was with the book people too. Yeah, she awesome. worked at the Playhouse too with us. Yeah, uh, yeah. Well, she put the costume on. She was fabulous. She put the headpiece on and the costume and allowed the um, uh, maggots to roll around her eyes and mouth. And uh, so I was ashamed and embarrassed um, all at once. Rightfully and, so. And yeah. rightfully so. And, you uh, pansy. And, 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 and so I, I guess that has to be my most embarrassing, and, uh, but ended up to be a, a decent scene. Uh, unfortunately, I had nothing to do with it. <laughs> okay, I'll give an answer. Um, I mean, first off, literally, I don't have a favorite scene, but considering your question and casting myself as a moviegoer, I'm just saying, actually, whatever you say about Stephen King as an actor, he's hilarious. And I'm gonna, like, those moments where he's freaking out, looking in the mirror, and in various forms, his daddy comes back to him with moralistic commands, that's hilarious stuff. I think that was really well let me add. Let me add something. When, when Stephen King, as the plant, blows his head off, it's Daryl in the suit, but okay, laying that's a down. favorite scene, yeah. But he's laying, his, his head is sticking through the set, but his body is the feet, because the feet needed to move and stuff, you know. It was like this. Yeah, way back. Out, out the back. So I'm in the ceiling with my button on the explosives that were in the top of the head, and I yanked the top of the head off. Well, every time I hit the explosives, the costume caught on fire. He didn't know that. <laughs> my head was in the other room. Right. So the and I couldn't move. The costume woman, Barbara Innocent, would have, she was ready with a fire extinguisher. Because it caught on fire three times. The grass is I didn't know. But so, yeah, you know, as, from behind the scenes, I'd say that's my favorite scene because it was so funny to be pulled out of that completely immobilized position to be told I was on fire. And, 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 and with the David, what's his name, was the producer who I usually... David Vogler, yeah, took me on a little walk. And, and, and he said, Daryl, we're doubling your pay on this one. I didn't know that. <laughs> Your favorite scene? Well, I mean, who could resist saying, Henry, I swear to God, I mean, what, what was the line? Oh, I was, Your I ball, something about his balls. Yes. <laughs> Get out of my way, Henry, or I swear to God, you'll be wearing your balls for a year. Right. <laughs> yeah. In 2012, I did nine months on General Hospital. The producer had written Prom Night, I think, Bob, Bob, Bob Guza. I don't know if you remember the name. But anyway, he was a big horror fan. So my character got to say to two mafioso guys on General Hospital at 3 o'clock in the afternoon on CBS, get them out of my way or I swear to God you'll be wearing your balls for earrings. Recycling. <laughs> the censors never cut. <laughs> well, one of my favorites. One of my favorite scenes is when Fritz Weaver goes to Hal Holbrook's place and tries to describe to him what happened. Oh, yeah. <laughs> totally. <laughs> I have a prejudice because I uh, finagled. Uh, my brother was a Catholic priest, Father Tom. And uh, in the Jordan Barrel, he witnesses that. He said, pass it on by then. But there's a sermon that play. My brother was a Catholic priest in Wheeling, West Virginia. So I finagled the way. He didn't know how I was going to use it. But I, I got the tape from uh, WITV. That's my brother, Father Tom. Yes. The Stephen King is watching. He's trying to watch. I guess he's passing on that. Really, I never knew that. A terrible sermon. <laughs> All right, folks. One more time. Casting.